Last Sunday night, I shared with you uh, that the church, the church that was doing the will of God should seek the man of God. And I want to continue that tonight. I want to uh, just share with you some things when you look at a pastor. What are you really looking for? So I'm, I'm going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and read the first seven verses. Perhaps you know these. I remember when I was, many, many years ago, when I was ordained. I was ordained in the Piney Woods of East Texas. And I have to admit, back in those days, boy, they really laid on you. I had about 12 old men up there sitting, you know, and they asked me questions. I didn't, boy, the good Lord was me. He had my hand, you know. And, uh, but most of the questions were taken right out of these verses of Scripture that we're going to look at. 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. If a man desires the offices of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, diligent, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his own children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, least being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Least he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Almighty God, as we read these words, I realize that none of us are perfect. There's no perfect preachers, no perfect individuals. But we're to strive, Lord, to be what you would have us to be. And we're to live that kind of a life because no one would have something to say about us that would cause us to find ourselves in trouble in some form or another. Lord, I pray that you speak to this your servant tonight the words that you'd have me to speak. And thank you, Lord God, for being with me holding my hand all of these many years. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, by the way, everything falls or arises with leadership. You know, last week we looked at God calling David. Samuel was asked to go to the house of Jesse to pick <coughs> a new king. And he goes to the house of Jesse and Jesse's sons are all marching for him. The first one is good looking. Boy, he's tall. Everything, you know. Samuel was absolutely sure that that was the one. But God said no. And all nine of his sons then passed before him and God said no to all of them. And then he said, isn't there still one left? Yes, but he's out there tending sheep. Go get him. When they brought him, God said, that's the one. And what I said last week is make absolutely sure that the man you call is the one that God would call. 
Now here tonight, we look at the, the qualifications, by the way, uh, of a minister, pastor. But, you know, uh, in the New Testament now, I know some of you probably said, well, that's speaking of a, of a uh, bishop. Well, in the New Testament, bishop, uh, elder, and pastor all are the same. They're synonymous together. Uh, you know, the bishop is to be the overseer of the church. Uh, so is the pastor. And the elders. All are to be the overseers of the church. And also with the uh, uh, pastor, he is also to be the shepherd of the flock. One who leads, one who cares for his flock. But all of them, all of them are to be qualified. Now a lot of people think, well, you know, hey, I, I don't know how I really haven't had a whole lot of experience in the last 15 years or so in how people are ordained or all that. But uh, I do know this. You see, one of the first things he says here then, that they must be, uh, must be blameless. Well, there's, there is no person really, no living individual that is sinless. But we're to strive to be blameless or to be above reproach. You see, there's nothing to be in the life of a minister that Satan or some unsaved individual can attack either that person or the church. Many times, listen to me, many times the church is attacked because of what the pastor has done or what he does. You know, we must strive to be blameless to be above reproach so that those people on the outside won't be able to find something wrong or amiss. The second thing he mentions here is a husband of one wife. Now in this day and time with everybody being divorced, I don't know, seems to me it would be hard come up with a person who would fit these qualifications. You'll notice in all of these, all the qualifications in this passage are uh, masculine. While there are many ways that women can serve, uh, you know, the office of pastor is not one given to women. Now women, you know, have all kind of things that they can do in the church and what have you, but not to pass. But a pastor's home life is very, very important, especially his marriage status. What it means, it means that a pastor must not be divorced and remarried. Now, Paul, listen, Paul is certainly not referring to polygamy here. Since no church member, let alone a pastor, would be accepted if he had more than one, one wife. We all know that. He's not referring to remarrying after death either. After the death of a wife. You see, members of the church were allowed to do so, so why would you punish a pastor? Keep him from remarrying. What is clear though, very clear, a man's ability to manage his own marriage and home indicates his ability to oversee the local church. A pastor who has been divorced opens up himself and the church to criticism from outsiders 
It's not likely that people with marital differences would consult a man who, had, who could not keep his own marriage together. I think you would understand that. Go back to common sense. Would you really honestly and truly want to go to somebody who couldn't keep his marriage straight, couldn't keep it intact, and talk to him about keeping your own intact? I don't think so. I don't think that would work. Notice that they're both here disqualified from being a a pastor, but let me also say to you, the same qualification here is for the deacons. Both. Very, very important. The third thing you notice here, he's to be vigilant. What is that? That means to be temperate. A pastor must so exercise his life he makes sensible judgments in all things. Doesn't mean he's always going to be absolutely right. Doesn't mean he's always going to be perfect. But he is again, as with blameless strives, to be that. Be sensible in all of his judgment. The judgment <coughs> he makes in all things, whatever it might be. Fourth thing is sober. He must have a serious attitude about his work. He does not cheapen his uh, position or work because of what he does or how he acts or any of those things. We got too many papers here. Mm -hmm. You know. I, I hate to say this, but a lot of ministers, they cheapen the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by doing foolish things. Foolish things. And cause all kind of trouble within the church or within the ministry. Number five, he used to be very good, be of good behavior. I think orderly would be a good translation here. In other words, the pastor should be organized in his thinking and in his living as well as in his preaching. You know, sometimes listen to some of these television preachers. You have to ask yourself, who called him to preach? Did God call him to preach? Or did they call themselves? And I think you would answer rightly if you listen. The sixth thing there to be given to hospitality. This just simply means literally loving a stranger. Now that was very, very important in the early church. But let me tell you something, it still is today. You know, loving people, inviting people in your home. Before the wife got sick, we used to invite people into our home. We have them in our living room, about 10 chairs. Someone said, how come you got so many? I said, well, we used to invite two or three families at a time to come. I'm sorry we can't do that anymore. But that, that's something the pastor needs to do. The seventh thing, then, he's be apt to teach. Notice he's apt. Teaching... The Word of God is one of, you know, a pastor, his main ministries. Now, that doesn't mean that he has to teach every Sunday school class or have one big class and the pastor will get up and teach all that. No, 
God calls men and women to teach. And in churches, they're there. But he is to be, he's to, apt to teach means that he is to be prepared to teach. Now this, this is not something either that comes from a certain school. You know, I don't care if you've been to Harvard or uh, wherever, you know. Doesn't mean that you're a good teacher. You know what makes a good teacher? It comes from a very careful study of God's Word. It means taking God's Word, studying it, knowing what it has to say. Someone has said, pastors who are lazy in their study are a disgrace in the pulpit. I think that just, you know, we understand that. Now, I know all of you have heard the number eight. He's not to have any wine. Did you know that? Now, Deacon ever so often tell you, well, Deacon can have a little wine, <laughs> but the pastor can't have any wine. Mmm. I can tell you why. God understand. If you never take the first nip or sip or whatever you want to call it, you're never going to have any problems. You hear people today say, I know a oh, little, little wine, a little of this, a little of that, it'll make you feel good. Yeah, it'll make you feel good, all right. So will that, uh, uh, what do you call it, oxide, codeine, or whatever it is. That'll make you feel good, do it. It'll also drive you crazy. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens to people who drink. Now, you know, I've heard all kinds of things, you know, about this. And down through the years, it's just been, you know, by the way, the members of the Corinthian church, you know, they got drunk. They got drunk even at the love feast that accompanied the Lord's Supper. They, you know, now wine was certainly wasn't the same as it is today, but I tell you what, all of these big breweries and wineries and what is it? Jack Daniels and everything else, they put everything they got into it to make money. They want you to drink. They want you to get caught up in all this. You know. But listen to me. I, I, I'm just very strong on this. A shepherd of God's sheep should never, never, never do anything to lead his sheep astray. Never. It means something, you know. Well, again, go back to the television. You can, you can see those who have a little sip in between asking you for money. Don't ever drink. Don't ever start. If you're drinking now, quit it. Stop it. And you go, be honest with me. Would you really want to see your pastor up here? Huh? No, you wouldn't. You know you wouldn't. Common sense would tell you that. So therefore, that's the reason he says the pastor not right. The ninth thing he says, no striker well. You know what that means? That means an individual who's always looking for a fight. You, you, ever, you ever run into somebody, go, they, they always walk around with their fists clenched like that. They're always looking for a fight. I want to get into a fight of some kind of 
Number 10, he's not to be greedy of filthy lucre. Boy, I'm telling you. Now this is, you know, <laughs> pastor's not paid very much. Do you know that? When I first started my little church out there in the Piney Woods of Texas, I was paid in pairs. I, I, how many of you ever watch this uh, uh, little house on the prairie or whatever it is? The doctor, he gets paid in you know, potatoes and all kind of thing. Well, that's the same way the pastors. They didn't get paid nothing. You know. So when you read this, he's not greedy or filthy lucre. You wonder, boy. <laughs> but you know what? I'm here to tell you there are a lot of covetous pastors. They have some kind of deals going on on the side. Making money over here. Making money over there. Doing all kind of things. Caught up in the stock market and everything else you see. And when your pastor gets so caught up in all of that, you can't do what God's calling to do. I never had enough money to get in the stock market. So I just, uh, you know, and I thank God for that too. Because, you know, I can understand how people can get, and everybody, you know, they cover this. They have some kind of deals going on outside the churches. These things erode to hinder the ministry. Pastors should not work for filthy lucre. First Peter chapter 5, verse 2 tells us that. Number 11, he says, be patient, be gentle. You know, a pastor has to be able to take criticism without reacting. Not easy done sometimes. <coughs> not easy done but he must be able to do that because he'll be criticized and some pastors by the way can't take it and they explode or whatever and cause all kind of problems he's not to be a brawler pastors are to be peacemakers not troublemakers. But then on the other hand, I think, you know, we know that a lot of pastors are troublemakers. I'm, just, I'm trying to think off the top of my head here a little bit too. But, you know, now you can, you can disagree with somebody without being disagreeable. Someone has said to short tempers do not make for long ministries. Do you know that today the average ministry is about two and a half years? And the pastor's gone and the church is calling somebody else again. Number 13, he's not to be covetousness. You can covet many things beside money, but you, usually it is money. But a lot of people, you know, they they covet a larger ministry. They get in the church, and they've been there for six months, haven't got to know everybody's name, and you find out they are applying for a bigger church on up the road somewhere, looking for some other place. Or, you know, it, it goes, in, they want to be famous in denominational work or whatever it might be. But of course, you know, again, this thing of being coveted centers mostly on money. Wait. Number 14, he used to have a godly family. Now, oh, uh, this, 
this does not mean that he has to be married or have children. However, you know, a man with a family who's married and has children and can manage that family well is a very pleasing thing unto God. You know, I I don't want to brag because my daughter is here, <laughs> but uh, God really blessed me and my family. It's been a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, my daughter's up here leading the music, you know, and all that. Uh, and ever since she's, I don't know. 10 years old, maybe, or earlier than that, I don't know. She's been singing and playing the piano and organ and doing all that kind of stuff. Our son, he's up there in North Carolina building a house. But he's always been. He's never been in trouble. In fact, he, uh, he worked for the government for, uh, I don't know, 20 some years, I guess, he retired. Now he's working in Dollywood. Neither one of them has ever given me any problems. And I can I can use that in saying that a man should be able to take care of his family. You know, if a man's own children will not respect and obey him. His church is not likely to obey his leadership either. You know, the church and the home are one and should be used in that way. We should observe both with love, truth, and discipline. You, you see, the pastor cannot be one thing at home and another thing at church. If so, his children will soon find out. And then, of course, that will cause all kind of trouble. Number 15. Notice he's not to be a novice. Now, this is just simply a newly... Christian. I've often thought, you know, in churches, churches have put people in places of leadership many times who've only been Christian for six months or so. Uh, you're asking for trouble when that, when that happens. Now, age is no guarantee of maturity, but you really don't have an opportunity to understand individuals until you know them for at least a year or so. Number 16. I know y'all saying, what is he going on and on and on? We can read that. I want you to really read and understand. If there's one thing you need to do, uh, George said pray. Yes. Pray, pray. But one thing you need to do is read the Word of God and understand what it has said. The 16th thing here then, a good, and this is so very important, he used to have a good testimony outside of the church. Does he pay, pay his bills? A lot of pastors, listen, find themselves in trouble because they can't pay the bills and all of those things. I uh, some of say, well, the church ought to jump in and help them. No. The 
they need to help themselves. And when they do that, they'll make a, have a good reputation outside of the congregation. You know. I know. I've been here a long time, yes. But one of the things that I had I had the last year or so I haven't, haven't been out much. But was a good reputation among the people here. Not only the bakers, because they want your money, but the doctors and the lawyers and all kind of people. Served on several living committees and things. I, I don't know. But I, I just think it'd be hard for a, for a minister or a pastor to really do his job if the people on the outside there said, you know, that guy, I know him. He does this, he does that, he does other things, he doesn't pay his bills, you know, all of that. He used to have a good report from those outside of the church. Well, you know what? No, no pastor now who's truly in the will of God is ever, will ever be what he ought to be. I mean, completely. There's no doubt about that. But when God's church finds God's man to be the pastor and all together are in God's will, I want to tell you something. The church will be what it ought to be It'll be what it's called to be, and it will be the kind of a church that God wants. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this time that we can come to look once again at your wonderful, precious, holy word. In those seven verses of scripture, there is so much. I only hit on it very briefly here tonight. But my prayer would be that the church and each individual member here will take these verses and look at them and let the Holy Spirit interpret them, each one of them. And when it comes time then to call the pastor, that they'll know exactly what the pastor is to be. I pray, Lord God, that you'll continue to bless this church, bless every member. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything that you've done for me, my family, and for this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to